what's going on. Hello? All right, let's do it. Okay, there we go. Hi guys, how are you? I just got this set up. I had some technical difficulties. All right. So, uh, how's everyone doing? My name, as you all probably know, is R.G. Pareto. I'm going to be doing um, a painting in front of you guys. I'm going to try to kind of talk through my process a little bit and explain to you what I think about when I'm painting. And so, yeah, here we go. I have... I should be able to see some of the comments here on my laptop. I'm sorry, on my... Okay, let's see if I can get some of these comments. That way I can answer some questions if need be. Oh, okay. Ah, hi guys. I see that there's a bunch of you. Hello. Hello, Eliza. How are you? Gail, Lee... Cheryl, Kelly. Oh, okay. So, <clears throat> all right. So my name is R.G. Pareto. Um, I'm an artist and an art historian. I live here in New York. And I'm going to do a painting for you guys. As you can see, what always happens is I accidentally spilled some ultramarine blue on my painting. That was not part of the idea, but we'll figure it out. Um beautiful reference photo that I'm using was posted on uh, the sketchy app by Laura Thompson. So Laura, thank you so much. I was looking through a bunch of photos and I really loved the building uh, and I loved the way the tree casts this kind of cool shadow on the building. And then even the fact that the tree is green and the building is kind of red brick and their complementary colors stood out to me. Um, so I'm going to concentrate really mostly on the building, the tree, um, and some of the details around it. And again, I'll explain what I'm thinking about when I'm doing this. So, oh no, there's only one person speaking. So before we get started, I'll explain what kind of brushes I'm using. I have a small squirrel mop. Um, I have a sable brush, with, which is a six round. I have a smaller sable brush, which is for details, but honestly, I don't use this too much. I try not to worry about details, you know, at least not early on. And then I have um, a rigger, a size two. So let's get started. To be honest, I'm really going to be painting mostly with these two brushes. When I have students or friends that want to start painting watercolors, I always tell them, honestly, your best bet is... is don't go nuts and start buying incredibly expensive brushes. It's not worth it, at least not initially. I do, however, recommend you buy one serious squirrel mop um, because this is your best friend when it comes to painting. This happens to be a pretty expensive brush, um, and I actually splurged on this a few years ago, and, and I love this brush. It's a Winsor & Newton Series 7 Sable brush. Right. Make sure you have plenty of water and you have a paper towel or a rag that you can kind of wipe uh, the excess water on. That is a necessity. And I'll talk about the colors that I'm using. I have a smaller set that I use when I, when I travel or when I'm outside, a little sketch set. Um, if any of you are familiar with my Instagram account or my work in general, I sketch a lot into small watercolor pads and I have maybe nine colors that I use every day. This is a larger plein air um, palette that I use. Um, and so I have a lot more colors, but to be honest, I really don't use every single color, every single painting. There will be situations where I might need a specific color, but for the most part, these are all just extra, just in case, to save time. Um, hi, guys. So, 
I'm gonna tell you every, every color. This is indigo. This is an excellent color called Shadow Violet, which I use quite often. This is the most important, to me at least. Uh, this is French Ultramarine, Cerulean Blue. This is a Daniel Smith color. I believe it's just called Khaki, if I'm not mistaken. I don't use this often because it's semi-opaque. And when I'm painting watercolor, I really, really tend to lean towards all the completely transparent colors. Um, I don't really use these. Even though it can be quite fun, this is Alizarin Crimson. This is, um, I believe it's maybe Fire Truck Red or just Red. This is Burnt uh, Quinacridone Orange. Aurelin, which is a really beautiful, kind of cool yellow. New Gamboge, which is a warmer yellow. This is Hooker's Green. Sap Green. This is an interesting color called Red Lunar Rock. I don't use it so often, but it's pretty cool to just have it. This is Quinacridone Violet, which is excellent color. Um, this is Neutral Tint, which I like, but I don't love this color. It is cool because you can warm it up or cool it down, um, and so you get excellent grays, but it doesn't have much punch you know i really prefer this shadow violet which has a tinge of lavender in it um which i appreciate because if you add a little blue it gets really nice and cool and then we have van dyke brown which i use to mix my very very dark colors all right and so enough of that stuff what i'm going to do is i'm going to activate my watercolors by just using this little squeeze bottle to just have some water on top. That way it'll be easier to pick the color up from the dry paint. Okay. So before I start doing the details, I wanna get these large shapes first. And there are all these rules for painting watercolor or painting in general. I was always told to uh, start from the back to the, you know, from the background to the foreground and I don't necessarily always do that, but I think in certain paintings it makes sense only because you want to look at the positive and negative spaces in your painting. So uh, Naomi wants to know if I can list the colors. Yeah, yeah, I can make a list and put them on the side or I'll speak to um, Alexander. By the way, before I really, really get started, I want to thank Alexander from, from, from Sketchy. She's gone above and beyond to make sure I manage to do this correctly, having several meetings. I'm very, very bad at technology, and she's excellent at helping me organize everything. So thank you so much to Alexander from Sketchy. She is phenomenal, so thank you. Um, there is um, a live group where you can keep up with the announcements there, by the way. And I'll share the artwork uh, when it's completed, if I don't manage to complete it during this session. Um, okay, so what I was saying earlier was to think about, of course, we need to look at the reference or look at what you're trying to paint, um, and that's fine, but we don't wanna just copy it exactly, right? I mean, I'm a big believer in trying to add a little bit of your own personality or your style into what you're painting. I don't wanna copy it directly, so I really think about shapes you know i think about what shape this is making the positive space and negative space the reason why i'm mentioning that is because when i start painting i like to start off with the sky for example even if i'm just going in light just to help me understand what the positive looks like right the positive and negative space um, and the good thing is you know it's pretty low stakes when you get started and i'm using just um a French ultramarine and just going right in to manage the sky a little bit and don't be too precious about you know the paint just get it on there I'm using 300 pound cotton paper and actually um, I don't remember the brand but I can also tell you guys on the site what brand it is um, and but it's 300 pounds, so it'll take a lot of watercolor before it starts to buckle, which is what you want. 
And so if none of you have ever painted watercolor, you're curious, you can't really go back and delete the watercolors or, you know, you can't always even paint over it. But when you have low staining colors, let's say like French ultramarine, what you can do is go back and there are no clouds, but I just want to show you, you can take a dry, a dry, um, you know, rag or piece of paper or what's it called? Yeah, some paper and then just, you know, kind of pull it back. So if you really wanted to add some clouds, you could, right? So it's low staining. And that's a, you know, that's a cool trick if you are, you know, if you have a bunch of clouds that you need to paint, um, which I don't, but we'll leave some of those in there just for effect. Um, yeah, let's leave them like that. Yeah, there you go. And we can always come back and add more. As I mentioned before, I actually dropped some paint here when I was filling paint into my uh, palette. So we'll see what we can manage to do with that. Valerie. Hello. How are you, Valerie? Thank you for joining us from Mexico. Hablas español por si acaso. Me imagino que sí, si eres mexicana. Okay. So, um, all this stuff over here, I'm going to just have to figure it out because I made a mistake with that, dropping that paint in. But, eh, we'll figure it out. I mean, hopefully it'll be a happy mistake, uh, a la Bob Ross. It happens. Um, I do want to say, when you're painting, you know, I think, especially... I mean, when I just started, I would be so nervous about painting and I'd want every painting to be the best painting. And that's, that's good. You know, you should strive to have, to make progress, but don't, um, you know, don't shoot yourself in the foot. You want to make sure that you're enjoying the process. You know, you're enjoying your painting and it's not something terrible. Um, you know, something stressful. Ultimately, if any of you have ever seen any of the tutorials I've done for Sketchy, you know, I really believe that in order to have good artwork, you have to enjoy the work you're making. Otherwise, you know, it becomes a chore more than something that you enjoy. And I think that's when painting kind of, you know, stops being as good as it could be. Hi, guys. Oh, wow. Brazil, Kazakhstan. Okay, so now I'm going to start painting the buildings in the back. And... Um, I'm not going to worry about detail. And in fact, what I'm trying to do here is mix a neutral color. So I'm taking two complementary colors. I'm taking French Ultramarine, which is a blue, and Quinacridone Burnt Orange, which is obviously orange, to give me, um, you know, again, just a neutral color that you can ignore because we're going to really pop this front building out using bright red colors. Okay, I'm just going to fill this in. And I don't try to be too perfect about laying these colors in in the background. Um, you see this here? This is called a backwash. That's, that's what happens when you put um, a color that has a lot of water next to something that was drying. It'll just backwash. And you really kind of want to avoid that, but I don't really worry about that when I'm doing the background color or setting up the scene, if you will, for my painting. Because ultimately, I really enjoy the the kind of juxtaposition between the finished element, which will be here, and the most important, and the background. So I actually dig the way that looks uh, at the end, you know, because it, it creates um, some tension between the building, which, you know, as you can tell, I, I really stayed here and tried to you know, draw it with uh, a ruler to make sure it's perfectly straight in order to make the building stand out. And ultimately, I want to choose this as the most important part of the painting, right? The building is what has to stand out. So everything else is secondary to the building. So I'm, I'm not worried about any of that stuff at all. 
the building will be really the meat and potatoes of the painting. Everything else is going to play second fiddle. So I, I like the kind of antagonistic way that, you know, this is going to look and I'm going to be a little bit organic with the with the foliage. And even if you want to get a little philosophical, you know, the idea of painting trees, you know, something that is literally organic, um, you know, shouldn't be something recipied, right? You don't want to exaggerate and make it something mechanical. We want it to look like a tree, which a tree is, you know, wild, right? It's organic. So I'm taking some Hooker's Green, which is a very bright green, and I'm going to dull it down a little bit with some alizarin crimson. And then I get this really nice green that we have over here. And I'm going to, again, just start, you know, dropping this in here. And I don't really mind if there's some um, runbacks here. That's fine. I kind of dig that. Um, I'm going to just put these over here just to explain to myself and to the viewer where the tree actually is. Um, and then we're going to, you know, come back and darken some spots up to make that tree pop out and look more uh, dimensional, right? Or realistic, if you'd like. All right. So here we go. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, let's just fill this in. Okay. Again, I love the way this tree really just almost devours the, the piece of architecture here. Hello, hi guys. Hello from Connecticut. Hi, Allison, Kander. All right, so now I'm just kind of placing some of the green. Again, we can come back and we're going to really organize ourselves to make this stand out. Um, but right now, again, I'm just worried about getting it on there so I can have an understanding of where that green is, or where that tree is, um, because the building will be, again, the focal point. But I really love the tree and so in my opinion you know great paintings or great watercolor paintings I should say are again a little bit antagonistic right you have warm and cool you have complementary colors like green and red for example here and um, I again I enjoy the push and pull of you know the way uh, for example, I'm painting the tree, and, you know, you can even splash some color on it. Don't worry about it. It's a painting. It's supposed to be something vibrant, right? Something that talks to you. So you don't want it to be dull and boring and really recipied. You know, all right. Yeah, I like that. And uh, let's put some green down here to let us kind of understand where those little bushes are in front. Again, I'm taking Hooker's Green, and I put a little bit of Alizarin Crimson only to dull it down a little bit since they're complementary colors. If you add a little red to green, it kind of knocks down the tone a little, which is, which is good. Uh, and then I'm going to add, just because I want it to stand out, a little bit of yellow, a little bit of Orlin, and so that'll make it just a little bit brighter. Oh, how nice, Valerie. Okay, so now I'm going to just add some of this green here. And again, I'm not being too precious about it. I'm just kind of throwing it on there. Um, Valerie says she's English, but she's living in Mexico, and I'm studying, I'm assuming. Valerie, I hope you're doing some plein air painting out there. I'm sure it's really beautiful. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to mix a color that's just a little bit lower, right, in tonal value. And so a little darker, if you want. And I'm still using that hooker's green and mixing a little bit of alizarin crimson. Um, and the reason for that is I want to show that there are two different 
planes, right? The top plane of these bushes, which would be getting more sun, right? The sun is coming from this side of the painting. Um, and so this side angle here, the side plane would be darker. Uh, it wouldn't be much, much darker, but I want to just add, maybe make it a little darker. Let's take some French ultramarine. Let's see how that works. Yeah, there you go. Just a little bit darker. And we can always come back and darken it up. Really, the wonderful thing about painting in watercolor is that's definitely going to have to be darker. Is that you you can build up, right? The fact is these colors are transparent. And so you can continuously add on and on and on, which is why we really won't manage to complete the painting um, because they're, you know, you could really add on quite a lot, but we'll get through a good amount of it. Now I'm going to take a little bit of that shadow gray that I like. Um, and the ground is a little bit hot. It's a warm color, but I don't want to make it too bright because it's going to take away from the building. So I'm just going to add a little, um, what was that? Orange, right? And I'm just going to drop it in in front of this bush. And I'm not really too worried about what that's about, what that looks like. I don't mind some, run, you know, run backs. That's cool with me. I just want to start to get to my building. And then we'll worry about some details after. So let's start talking about this building here. We know it's red brick, it's quite bright. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna mix um, a color to describe the building that's getting hit with the most amount of light, which is gonna be the brightest color. Um, and I'm gonna exaggerate that color a little bit. Then we're gonna worry about the color that's in shadow um, that has to be much darker and that's going to give dimension to the building and then we'll figure out some mid-tones so we can do some details um, on either side so let's start doing that and really that's 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 how you add dimension to in any painting the way you add dimension is by adding tonal value so if you have something that has one tonal value looks flat. If it has a second and a third, now you're adding dimension, right? The more tonal value you have, theoretically, the more three-dimensional uh, the object is gonna look. Now, the issue is time and technique. So we could you know, continuously add and glaze colors over and over, um, but of course, I paint a lot plein air, so I need to make sure that I have time to finish my painting before I leave, and then you need to think about when to stop. Uh, that's important. Sure. Oh, okay, right, so you could see the, okay, let's do that. Well, maybe this is better, actually. Is that is that better for you guys, if you could see that? Is that better? So then you can see the colors I'm mixing here. Okay, so, I'm gonna take some alizarin crimson, and I wanna mix a decent amount of this color because uh, I'm gonna use it for the entire building. And I wanna make sure I have plenty of water in there. Alizarin crimson, and then I'm gonna take some quinacridone burnt orange, which again, I really love that color. Um, what's excellent about quinacridone colors is they're really uh, transparent and they're low staining, and so you can, they're very highly pigmented as well, so you could glaze, and we can talk about glazing at the end of the painting or, or closer to the end of the hour. I'll explain glazing, which is really excellent, especially if you're painting flesh tones or if you're painting really intricate detail. Um, hi, porcupine pancake art. Um, and so, oh my God, there's so many things I wanna tell you guys. So much information to share. So for example, with the building, I'm gonna start off light. And so the paper is the color white, okay? Um, in watercolor, as I'm sure most of you know, and if you don't know, you don't typically paint with white because all watercolor is transparent. 
Um, I do have some gouache that I use sometimes if I feel like I need it. Um, but otherwise, the transparency of the watercolor is what gives you different colors. So for example, if I wanted pink, I could just water down my red and mix with the white of the paper, you'd have pink. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the color, and I quite like it here, and I'm going to add some water. Actually, let's add some clean water. And so let's let's see how that looks. Yeah, I kind of like that. I actually want a little more orange. I want it to be a little bit more orange. Okay. And now we're going to do a little bit of, you know, some detail. Not detail, but a little... You have to kind of pay attention to where the brush is landing in order not to complicate what's going on. All right, and now what I'm doing is I'm going to just fill this in, okay? I'm sorry I'm not talking much. It's because I'm kind of trying to concentrate. Um, but to be honest, you don't have to worry too much about getting water uh, this color on the opposite side. You know, we're basically going to use that color to make a darker color anyway. So we'll figure it out. Um, again, I, I try not to be too precious about this stuff because then you start adding pressure to yourself and, and then you're not really enjoying So. Um, really, if it's not enjoyable, then I, I, I don't manage to, to do to do it. You know, I mean, sometimes when I do commissions, they're not my favorite, and I just do them. But even still, I, I really enjoy doing the paintings. You have to find the angle that makes you enjoy what you're doing. Um, when I was asked to do um, this live tutorial, or even the you know tutorials that I will be doing, for sketchy for uh, the landscapes, I, I was so happy because I managed to now paint what I like, which I, I love architecture and landscape, um, and so that's that's something that I love doing. You know, the idea of combining uh, architecture and landscape is interesting to me. So you have to find what you enjoy painting ultimately. And I never actually thought that that would be the case. You know, architecture can be a little bit intense, but honestly, if you have a little patience and a ruler, you're, you're pretty much halfway there. All right. All right. Um, there are a bunch of vines here, so I'll leave some space and I can just add those on later. There's a cool little blind window here. So I want to leave that out so I can just come back and fill it in. There is also some brickwork here. So I want to leave space so I remember to kind of, you know, make sure I show that there is a difference between the brick here and the brick down here. Okay. All right, I dig that. I like that. And now, well, I'm not even going to do anything on that side because it'll be the darker shade. And by the way, um, just for your own edification, watercolors really dry much lighter than they look when they're wet. So, you know, don't be too scared of, you know, making some strong colors because it'll dry down way, way, way uh, lighter. You know, all right. So now we're starting to see the building and understand the architecture a little better. All right. Um, you won't really see too much of this pillar here, but let's just kind of place this in here just so we don't forget where it is. How are you guys doing? You guys all right? All right, I dig that. 
And I mean, we're still going to work over here and make sure we, you know, punch in those beautiful shadows. Oh my goodness, it's already been half an hour. That's crazy. I'm not even a quarter way done. All right, so now what I'm going to do is add a little bit more red and orange. And now I want to think about a shadow. All right, shadow color. So I'm literally using the same two colors that I use for the rest of the building and adding ultramarine blue, okay? So the blue obviously cools it down and um, it's just one of the best colors. So when you start painting watercolors, you should think about if you don't have any colors at all, you know, I really suggest you get three colors, right? A yellow, a red, and a blue. And theoretically, you can mix any color. And I say theoretically because, of course, there are really bright, bright greens. Uh, like, I don't know, like chartreuse. You wouldn't really be able to manage to match exactly. But you really can get so many with that triad, right? Um, and French Ultramarine is really excellent for those shadow areas because you really want to cool it down. You don't want to change the entire color. So, you know... Don't go out and buy, you know, every single color. You don't need that. I think you become a better painter when you just kind of dial it down. Um, it's more challenging also, for sure, but you'll, you'll be better faster, actually. All right, let's try this out and see how it goes. Yeah, I like that. We can always make it a little darker. I dig that. All right, so we'll use this over here. Um, yeah, here we go. So this piece of the building actually pushes back, so it'll all be in shadow. And then we'll make a separate shadow tone for the red brick part of the building. And actually, I didn't manage to do this, but if we look here, these separate kind of wings, if you want, start here and we'll go back down this way. So I wanna make sure that I still explain the architecture um, just to make it legible, right? So when you look at it, you understand what's happening. All right. Um, and now over here. It's actually pretty cool how if you think about, you know, you have these two colors that you place next to each other, and the fact that they're just a few tonal values away from each other, it gives you a sense of three dimension if you look at it. Um, I love that. I think that's really what makes a painting so interesting is how you can manage to just place colors next to each other and then you read them as dimension. Okay. So I've been mixing all my colors on the palette and then placing them on the painting, um, which is, you know, what I do quite a lot. But then, for example, with this over here, with the shadow area, which is quite a large shadow area. I don't want it to be just bland. What I'm gonna do is just take some French Ultramarine, fresh from my palette, and just drop it in and let it just blend in. And then you get these kind of weird, um, you know, colors and spots, uh, which I just think are more interesting than just having something totally one color, right? I mean, that's something we're going to have to talk about when we start to do the facade or the front of the building. Uh, it looks a little bit bland to me because it's so flat in one color. So we don't want that to happen. So we'll add some um, you know, other colors just to make it a little bit less flat and boring. But now we're starting to get really into expressing the three dimensionality of the building. Which honestly is half the battle. Once you manage that, you're, you're, you're all right. You know, you can really experiment with the rest. Um, I'm going to make some more of this color, which again was uh, quinacrone burnt orange, some alizarin crimson, and French ultramarine. Maybe I'll make this a little bit darker. All right. How are you guys doing? You guys doing all right? Okay, let's start punching this in here. And again, I'm, I'm not terribly worried about detail right now. Um, so I'm still using a seven round. Because uh, I don't want to 
you know, worry about detail yet. I'm actually going to leave this a little bit here. All right, so I'm going to punch this in here. And I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I'll take a little bit French Ultramarine and just drop it in there so it gets a little bit darker. It's also the side of the building. It's not necessarily terribly important to what we we're trying to talk about, right? We're really trying to speak about this building. Um, yeah, I'm also going to cut down that bush in the front. Yeah, there we go. There we go. All right. So what is interesting here is we have a little bush back here, and we're going to use that to our advantage. We're going to use it to describe light. We're going to use it to talk about how the light is going to kind of turn over. There's a little bush back here, a little tree, and half of it will be in shadow. It's the cast shadow from the building. Um, so then, you know, we can, it'll really have a highlight, which would be up here. It'll have a shadow area, which will be the opposite side of where the sun is coming from. And then it'll have a cast shadow. So this is a cool way to show, you know, three-dimensionality. And so what we want to do is we don't want to be bogged down by the details of what's going on back here. So we can drop some neutral greens back here just to kind of allow this to stand on its own. You know, those are things to think about. Um, when... The same way this is kind of the protagonist of the entire painting, for me, this little tree here is pretty important to show three-dimensionality. So everything behind it is going to be subdued because I want this to stand on its own. I don't want anything to take, you know, attention away from this when you're looking around the, the entire painting. Same thing in this area here. There's some kind of leftover architecture from the building next to it. Um, and then it's really just, uh, it looks kind of like a ravine or something. So I might drop in part of that building here. I'll add some more bushes here. And again, when you're painting, I think really the most difficult thing is to manage to look at something that has so much detail, so many things going on, and then pick out what makes sense to put in. Um, that takes a long time because that, that really has to be, you know, you develop that on your own. Nobody can really teach you that. And that, I think, has something to do with your style. Um, but what I think is important, and I can, you know, give you a hint or help you out a little, is even when you go look at a painting, for example, if you go look, if you know, you go to a gallery, you go to the Met, for example, you look at a painting, those beautiful uh, let's pick a, a watercolor. It's like John Singer Sargent. Um, I always talk about him when I speak about watercolors because for me, he was really kind of the epitome of a proper watercolorist, someone that manages to talk about light in his paintings and texture and describe architecture. And he wasn't finicky about it. And so if you look at his paintings, there's almost always a focal point and something that he dedicates quite a lot of time and detail to. And the rest of the painting sometimes looks like just brush strokes, but when you look at it and you look at the focal point, you're not really paying attention to that. So this area is one of those areas. Um, I hope that is helpful because that was something that took me quite a long time to figure out, to be honest. Okay, let's do the canopy up here for the building. Um, it's going to be a little warm because the entire building is kind of warm, but I want it to be darker just so the building stands out. I'm going to take some Van Dyke Brown over here. And again, we can always make it darker. I'll add a little French, uh, no, not French ultramarine. I'll add some alizarin crimson here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this in. It's going to be warm. And then maybe underneath we'll come back. Um, oh, good. Sihana, I'm glad. Uh, I'm going to make this a little bit cooler just to show that it's, you know, in shadow. Uh, let's just knock this in place first. Again, I really dig how the tree is kind of eating the building. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I like that color. Um, I will give you guys another hint or, or something helpful. Um, 
one is to always get artist quality watercolor paint. Um, and it's and it's really not about buying expensive paint. Again, you really would do well just getting you know blue, red, and yellow. But the reason for buying watercolor paint that's of artist quality is because of the pigment load. Okay, and so obviously watercolor paint is made out of pigment and a binder. Um, and so you artist watercolor paints have a higher pigment load. And the reason that you want that is because you'll be able to mix brighter colors, okay? So what I mean by that is if you buy student-grade watercolor, uh, which is fine. I mean, I've, I started using that paint myself when I just started. Um, once you mix three colors, I don't know if you'll notice, but sometimes the color tends to look really muddy. And you really want to try to avoid that unless you're actually painting something that is supposed to look that way. Let's say like, you know, if you're painting out near like a dumpster or something like that and you want it to look kind of dingy and grimy, then that makes sense. But otherwise, you want to make sure that you're picking three colors. And there isn't, you know, there are always rules and rules are really are made to be broken but it's just kind of something to think about when you're painting is to just try to keep it to three color mixes. I think that's something really helpful because you'll avoid getting muddy and colors that just will look kind of, you know, a mess. You want to try to avoid that as much as possible. Okay, let's see. We'll probably go a little bit over an hour, but let's start talking about the shadow areas here. Um, what I want to do there is I'm going to take some of the French Ultramarine and, you know, maybe I'll take a little purple, some Quinacridone Violet, because I want it to be different from the shadow areas that the building that is in shadow. Um, so let's just start doing this so I can kind of talk to you guys about the shadow. And so when I'm doing the shadow, I'm really just looking at... Um, the photo and I'm and I'm not trying to be you know spot on I'm I'm just kind of placing the shadow areas in there because there's shadows you know you don't want to be too uh, mechanical about it right it, it, it shouldn't be so recipe it should really kind of um stand out on its own so we want to leave some open spaces to you know show that it's light that's kind of coming through the tree and obviously the leaves I might even do a little bit of that with the brush. Um, oh, we didn't even get to the door yet, but I'll do that in a second because I want to definitely drop shadow over that. And so once I have that, I, now I look here and I realize this has to be much darker. So then I can start talking about that in a little bit. Now let's just add some of these architectural details here. Um, whatever we manage to see. You know, maybe we'll exaggerate it just so it looks a little cooler. You know. There's also a little line that comes down this way. The architecture. Yeah, there you go. Um, and we're going to do the same thing on this side. But what I want to also do is make sure that I explain that this is also in shadow because of that canopy that's on top of these. So that's also in shadow. And there you go. All right, now we're cooking. See, little by little, it starts to come together. Um, I'm gonna paint the little doorway now. So I'm gonna grab some quinacridone orange um, excuse me, maybe a little blue, just to knock it down a little bit. I don't want it to be too hot. I don't want it to be too attention grabbing. Um, I want the entire building to kind of be the most important part. So I'm just going to lay this in here. Again, this is something I'm just laying and I'm not being too precious about it. I just want it to be there. I don't want to make it the protagonist if you want, you know? Um, actually, 
let's let's mix some more of the regular brick color because yeah let's just drop this in here okay all right once that dries we'll see what it looks like and now let's continue to drop this uh, shadow color in. Um, there's a cast shadow that comes from the side of the building that we're going to drop in here. Again, we can always add uh, the vines that are kind of growing on the side of the building in a second. And we'll even put some shadow for that stuff. And explain that there is some dimensionality here as well as here. Um, you know, feel free to exaggerate. I mean, you really don't get a very long cast shadow from the architecture here on top of this blind window. But, you know, exaggerate. Why not? I mean, it's a painting. Um, again, I really don't think your goal in painting should be to mimic a, a, a photo. You know, you want to kind of say something about what you're painting. Uh, otherwise, just take a photo, you know? Um... I promise once you feel more comfortable painting, you'll you'll understand that there's a, an important difference between painting and, and photography, you know. You don't want to copy the painting. Uh, even when you're paint, you know, even when you're painting outside, you're not trying to copy it exactly. You're trying to look at it, understand it, and then give your rendition of what is happening, okay? Um, just because we don't have that much time, I'm going to start thinking about the shadow areas and the mid-tone values in the tree. So if you remember, we mixed hooker's green. So we'll start with the hooker's green here. I'm gonna mix a decent amount of that. And I'm gonna add some alizarin crimson again, just to kind of knock that down a little bit. And actually that's pretty dark. Um, I'm not gonna mix too much water into it. Maybe just a dot. And I'm just spraying it because this is clean water and the water that I'm using to clean my brushes is starting to get dirty. Take a nice amount of paint on there. And similar to the shadow area, I don't draw in my shadow areas when I'm painting leaves or trees, but I will just to help you guys understand. So basically I'm looking at the reference photo, and if you look here, there's a definite darker area in here, right? So we're gonna underline that, and then it goes in clumps. So there's like one clump, two clump, three clumps, right? And so those will be in shadow. And then even think about the fact that the sun is up top coming down, right? So obviously all the lighter areas will be facing the Northwest. Um, and again, when you do the trees, just know you can always add more values, right? You can always make it a little darker. Um, so here, I'm gonna start doing this, making this darker here. There you go. You know, I'm just kind of explaining. I'm looking at the reference photo, but I'm not trying to copy it exactly. You know, maybe Gonna squeeze your brush out like that. And oh, and you can even add some you know, to, to these little to explain that there are shadow bits also over here. Now we can add a little water and kind of water it down and then add some mid-tone values here and just blend it right into the shadow area. And then you'll get something that we really didn't manage to talk about so much at this point, but um, I promise I'll talk about it much more when I do my demos for Sketchy is um, edges, right? We have kind of lost edges right here meaning you don't see the difference between this shade color, this color, and this color, and then we have dark, hard edges here. Um, so you really want to find a balance of those different things. And that'll give you some you know, more natural looking tree. And then, 
of course, will come back and make a lot of this even darker, right? I'll make it even darker. And again, so for example, I think I put a little bit too much dark green here. I'm just going to dip my brush, make sure it's clean, and then I'm going to dry it. And then I can actually come back and pull some of that apart here. Okay. Let's paint this other tree, um, which is kind of similar, but let's make it a little bit... Let's make it this other green here. This is sap green. I'm going to take sap green, add a little red, and I'm going to paint the entire tree first. Actually, you know, we'll do this, and the shadow area will will make it a lost shadow. I mean, a lost edge. Sap green. Let's add a little French ultramarine, and then, so this is still wet, and then I'm adding wet paint, right? And so now we're understanding that the light is coming from the top left. And so it's darker down here. And this is called wet into wet. Okay. And then we're going to wait for this to dry and then add the shadow that's being cast from the building on the tree. And that'll be a hard shadow. Um, just so you understand the difference between, uh, you know, lost and found edges and, you know, hard lines and soft lines. All right. Let's go a little bit longer. I know. I wanted to keep it to about an hour. We'll go a little bit over. Um, all right, let's exaggerate a little bit over here with the top of this canopy. I'm going to make it really orange like that. I'm pretty happy with that. And then let's get down with that interior there. I'm going to take some, uh, I think I mentioned it before, I'm going to do that a little darker with some French ultramarine because I want it to be cool right because it's the underside of the canopy um, but what I am going to do is I'm going to just quickly try to understand the architecture there would be a line here and a line here and so I want to make sure I want to stay on this side of those lines yeah there you go there we go and maybe we'll leave a little lip there just to give it some variety. You know, let's drop uh, this line here. Yeah, there we go. Eh, don't worry about that. There you go. I dig that. Um, like I said earlier, this should be much darker, so now I'm going to come back and darken that. Um, let's do French Ultramarine and, um, you know, some of that purple, some quinacridone violet. And this is glazing, actually. So that's that part of the painting is already dry, and I'm just going to take this color, and I'm going to punch it in and make it stick out stand out there we go all right there we go that is much better that is much darker that's exactly what we want And again, that's kind of the great thing about watercolors. You can do that. Um, actually, now that I'm doing that, I definitely want to make the other side of the building darker as well. But I also want to make sure that this is perfectly straight. So I'm going to take a T-square, which is an invaluable tool. It's absolutely necessary. There you go. That looked a little wonky. So I'm going to do that same color, and I'm just going to drop it in. And it should give me really a much better explanation of the three-dimensionality of the building. You see that? All right, now we're cooking. 
Now we're cooking. Here we go. And I'm going to go all the way to that line, which is actually, that was bothering me. I could tell it wasn't perfectly straight. And here we go. We're just describing the planes of the architecture in order for them to look three-dimensional. All right. All right, I dig that. How are you guys holding up? You guys, you guys all right? If there are any questions, please feel free to ask. I'll do my best to answer your questions. Rosalie, how are you? Okay, so now I'm just punching this in here. And I don't know if you can see, but in the reference photo, there are a few windows. And so um, they're really in shadow, so I'm not going to make a big deal about those. I'm not going to get too worried about how dark they look or how perfect I need to um, paint them in. So I'm just going to take this dark violet, this shadow violet. And I'm just gonna make a few quick lines, little darts. That's actually not dark enough. I'll grab some Van Dyke Brown. There you go, and maybe some ultramarine blue and a little alizarin crimson just to make a really dark color. And I'm just gonna punch that in to, you know, explain that there are some long lancet windows in this building here. Um, again, I'm not really too worried about detail there. I just want to make you understand what's going on. And actually, now that we're here, let's punch in that shadow that's coming off of the building. I'll take some sap green and a little French ultramarine. And it's this shadow that's going to be cast, so... I'm just going to punch it in, and I want some hard lines there. All right. There you go. You could even let them blend into each other, right? There you go. All right. All right, let's, and while we have this color, let's just, why don't we just continue on to our enormous tree here. This should be much darker, so I want to be really careful about where I place that. Um, looking at the reference and just, for example, over here, right above the architecture, it's a little bit darker. Right down here by the shadow area. Um, and there are tree their leaves behind this part of the building. So I'm actually going to just punch those in. I'm going to make that darker in one second, actually, because I want you to understand that it's behind the building. Again, don't forget to put some of the dark areas on the opposite side as well. Oh, thank you so much, Allison. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I think that, again, that's kind of where you want to be. You know, you want to use a photo or what you're looking at, um, if you're painting plein air, as a kind of jumping off point. But you don't want to just copy it, you know. Um, you want to try to find something that makes it more interesting to you or, or your version of what you're looking at. Um, and I promise that you'll probably have more fun that way um, thank you so much Allison I really appreciate that okay I mean you know when I paint I drive around and I mean there are places I like to go but I, I, I like to go somewhere and when I see something and I think, all right, well, that's interesting, but I'd like to, you know, delete that or add this. 
um, you know, ultimately you edit what you're looking at, your painting. Um, I decided to concentrate on this. I mean, the entire reference photo is really interesting. You know, maybe if I was in front of this building, I would add, um, you know, for example, the power lines. I mean, we can still do that, but you could add the power lines and all that stuff. And that's cool too. Um, it just depends on what you want to, what you want to get out of it or what you're trying to say about what you're looking at, you know? I know it sounds a little, um, like heady, but it's true. Ultimately, this is your painting and you, you dictate what you want to say about what you're looking at. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty happy with this actually. I have to admit, I was a little nervous. Um, no, no, I didn't use a projector. I actually drew it by hand before, right before, um, you know, I went on live. Um, but I drew it by hand. And, I mean, it's just easier. I, and if you don't draw often, um, it's not that it's, it's not it's hard to draw. It, it's just a matter of practice. Like if you draw often, I promise you'll get much better at drawing and then you'll be able to draw easily. Um, architecture just manages to be a little bit more cumbersome only because you're dealing with, you know, usually rigid geometrical shapes, but you can also just bring a ruler. I bring a, a little um, T-square everywhere I go when I sketch and stuff. And um, if my sketch, oh, I have my sketchbook actually. Is anybody curious about looking at my sketchbook? I can show you a few pages before I kind of push off and finish. All right, let's just... So all the other stuff that's left isn't things that I'm terribly worried about. So I'm just going to, you know, finish them uh, or try to do them while we're all here. Um, I mean, they're they're important, but but they're not the most important so let's see i'm going to punch this in here and then uh which was a sap green with a little new gamboge and i'm going to kind of dial it back down with a little alizarin crimson um yeah i'll show you a little bit of my sketchbook in a second actually uh it's right over here um that's that this i'm going to paint green in a second um, over here we have some leftover building, so I, I don't really want you to pay attention to that. So I'm going to make, you know, a neutral color with, with, with some leftover colors that I have here. And some of this red lunar rock, which is a red color. And let's see how that looks. Again, I want to kind of make it melt into the background so you're not really paying attention to it. Um, so I'll use this kind of neutral color that doesn't take your eye away from the, the, the most important part of the painting. Okay. Uh, I'll do a few more details and then we'll call it a day and I'll show you guys, um, you know, a few pages from my sketchbook. I love painting in sketchbooks and I, and I love looking at sketchbooks. Um, so, uh, I teach art history at a university here in New York and I've also taught, um, fine arts and my favorite thing to do was, uh, look at my students' sketchbooks and share our sketchbooks because really managed to look at a lot of interesting you know, ideas, even when we would go draw outside, um, you know, you could have two people looking at the same thing and come up with something totally different, which I think is excellent. I mean, that's kind of the point of art, right? It's not supposed to be something recipe. It's not supposed to be something um, that looks the same when everyone does it. Uh, that's the good thing about art. So I love sketchbooks. I'm just going to do a few details here before I show you guys my sketchbook okay all right I'm, I'm decently happy with this I'm gonna add actually a little bit more of the shadow area on the door over here so again a little French ultramarine and quinacridone violet 
Uh, since this is dry, I'm going to go ahead and just punch in some more of the you know, foliage. Yeah, there you go. Maybe up here a little bit, there. Okay, I'll take that. And also, I mean, once we're once we're done, I'll continue doing the painting, and I'll and I'll make sure that I share it with you guys so you can have a look. Um, so the white spaces on the bottom, I'm gonna fill in. You know what? I can fill them in now. Um, if we look at the. Some of this will be some of that sky color that will come down. And then if you look at the reference photo, it's just some nondescript plants and stuff. So I'm going to take some green and I'm going to mix in a little red. Again, I don't want it to pop off and be too um, intense because I don't really want you to worry about this. I don't want you to, as a viewer, to kind of connect too much here. I'm just trying to make this space... Um, you know, something that your eye will just kind of not pay attention to so much. But of course, we should make it make sense. So we'll drop some green here, come down. And then in here is kind of the remainder of the, the bushes over here. And I'm going to use that same green on this side just to balance it out a little bit. That's a really weak kind of green that I diluted with some um, quinacridone red. And then I can even come back. I'll take some sap green. I'll add a little bit of red. And I'll... Yeah, I'm going to add that once this is all kind of dried up. And here, I'll add this here just to give you the dimensionality, right? There are two planes that we need to express right here, right? The top of the bushes and the bottom. And, um, you know, add a little orange just to make it darker, and then we can even kind of come and describe this little bush here if we want. I'm going to just soften those edges because, again, I don't want that to take your eye away from the most important part of the painting, which is the building itself. The tree trunk I'll place in there in a second. Um, I am going to just kind of, I'm already here, so I'm just going to kind of explain this little part of, yeah, here we go. This is really, see, so this leads you into the front door. You know what we can even do? I'll make this a little bit darker. Like that. And then we'll even, you know, place a cast shadow. Right. Well, we could do that. We can even I'm gonna take a little bit of that um, shadow violet here and just try to punch in a little tiny cast shadow. Yeah, there you go. Um, eh, there you go. Some cast shadow down here on the floor. Once that's dry, I'll add, um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely stuff that I would like to continue doing, and I will once we finish up. For example, I might take my brush with some water and just drop it in here. And this is actually called a wet mask. It's just water on the paper. And then I take the color I want and I can just drop it in there and it should just be nice and light and not, you won't have any stark lines, you know, these massive lines. 
I never, I didn't actually plan on putting sh uh, clouds in here. We just, if you were here from the beginning, you would have seen, I was just talking about how you can pull back with a tissue paper, some of that blue. Okay. Yeah, yeah, this is a great photo. I really enjoy it. I mean, there's so much. I I'm probably going to come back and do some detail back there. Um, I'll punch in a few last things, and I'll, I promise I'd share my sketchbook, so we'll take a few minutes to do that, and then, and then we'll call it a day. Um, theoretically, I probably have another 40 minutes on this, maybe, just to tighten things up, but it would really just be to just tighten some things up and make sure that everything is, you know, copacetic, if you want. Let's punch this in here. There's a cool little blind window. There's one on the opposite side. So again, I'm going to make a really dark color to just kind of make that stand out a little bit, which, and I'm not going to make a big deal about it. Like, that's it. You know, a little just dagger stroke. All right. All right. I mean, I'm pretty happy with that for now. Um, since I have some dark paint here, maybe I'll do some of the details here. Now we can continue on with some of the details here. Yeah, there you go. Um, just be careful of putting too many details in your shadow area. You know, you don't want to exaggerate because it'll really take away from the rest of the painting. So for example, I think that was a little bit too much. I can just dab it down a little bit because I don't want it to be too big of a deal because I don't want it to take away from the front of the building. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to add some detail back here to the building. It's not necessarily detail, but a few lines. And then let's do the tree trunk because I feel like someone was just asking about it. Okay. For the tree trunk, I'll take some of this red. I don't want to just make it totally, totally brown. First, I'll take some of this red, and I'm going to place the trunk in here. So now what I can do is come back, and since it's not dark brown, I can actually use a dark brown mixed with blue and then punch some shadow areas thank you Lainey. i really appreciate that um i try to be as informative as possible you know i think that's really important i want you guys to get something out of this i think it's cool to watch people paint i do that myself quite often but i think if you manage to be informative at the same time it manages to be even better so i'm trying my best to be informative and talk through my process so you understand what's what's happening because ultimately painting or drawing is, is really i'm sure many of you've heard it before it's just a new way of looking at things and um you know sometimes it's good to listen to someone explain how they manage to look at things um, that'll help you with your process and anything that'll help you with your process is is important and uh, if I can help I'm, I'm totally into that I will right, we'll let this dry and then I'll, I'll add some darker tones here to that okay uh, this is as far as I'm gonna get on the painting for you guys I'll continue on my own but I hope you enjoyed that uh, I'm going to share, as I mentioned before, my sketchbook, which just man is just sitting right here. So here is what we managed to get through together today. Linda, you're so welcome. I'm so happy I, I did this. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I paint online live on my Instagram quite often, um, but I never explain too much. I don't do like a tutorial, but this was fun. I really enjoyed it, so maybe I'll do it again. Alexander, from Sketchy, let me know. Um, oh, thank you so much, Linda. Thank you, LWS, I appreciate that. I will share my sketchbook with you guys. Um, 
this is what I'm carrying now, which is not complete. So, and I don't even, I have, I have a bunch of stuff in here though. And this, these are all watercolors. This is a moleskin watercolor sketchbook. Um, this used to be the large one, but I think they make ones that are even larger now. Um, and, and I like the paper quite a lot. Um, I'm trying to think, I just bought another sketchbook. Does anyone else buy sketchbooks every single time they go to an art supply shop, even if they don't need them? Because that's exactly what I do. Candor, thank you. Um, here, I'll share this stuff with you guys. And just so happens, these are all watercolors. So I carry these with me and I paint all of these plein air. So if it's super hot or there's no shade area, shaded area, I'll sit in my car and paint. But I also have, um, you know, like a little plein air watercolor setup. Oh, Lee, I'm so happy you feel that way. I'm glad. Um, yeah, Sketchy is excellent. I, I mean, I've been working with them for a little bit now, and they, they really are interested in making sure you guys get great content. So, you know, you have to be happy about that. Um, I do my best to make sure that the things I, I teach about are, um, you know, informative and entertaining. Um, I thought I'd be way, I thought I'd speak way more about art history, but I didn't. But next time I will. Um, I'm a super art history nerd, and I think it's really important as a as a painter to be interested because then you understand, you know, the way things were and could be. Oh, that's cool. I'm making a cookbook. That's excellent, Allison. This is my baby. No, Sahana, these are just sketches. And actually, I left that out on purpose. Um, I really dig, again, like the kind of juxtaposition between something very finished and painting and something kind of unfinished and unpainted. And you'll see, I leave a lot of negative space out. And this is my sketchbook. You know, I, I try not to worry about making finished paintings. I try to just look at what I'm painting and try to, you know, paint my version of what's happening. Oh, great, Beth. I'm happy. Oh, you're so welcome. This is my baby, my little boy, Teddy. Um, this is a church uh, facade. I, as you know, or maybe you know, I love architecture. Uh, this is a neo-Gothic building, and I, I love this building. I, I, um, I draw it often, and I paint it often. It's just random places I managed to find studies my, my cousin debbie did this so shout out to my cousin um this is a study i did and randomly uh, my sweetheart will write me notes in my sketchbook which i dig so they're not always full complete you know paintings i i depends on what i'm doing at the time but this is an unfinished sketch uh, of my girlfriend sleeping so I have to make sure I catch her again so I can finish this painting. Um, this is actually what I might go back and do for my class on Sketchy. Um, this is one of my favorite places to paint, which is a museum here in Long Island. And I love the architecture there. I might actually do a tutorial on this specific, or this building, maybe another part of the building. I try to do at least one a day, Sahana. This is in Brooklyn in bed -Stuy. I was visiting a friend and I love the architecture and those brownstones in Brooklyn. Another building, lots of dappled light. The moleskin books are cool, but they don't deal with heavy, um, heavy water color washes so well, but thank you, Booker. This is an unfinished painting of a sculpture an outdoor sculpture at the Nassau County Museum of Art. This is a quick little portrait of my dad. Um, we had lunch the other day and I managed to sneak in a little portrait. This is back at the museum. Really beautiful Beaux-Arts architecture. Oh, this was excellent. I didn't have much time here, but it's the um, Untermeyer Garden in Yonkers. It's beautiful. If you guys are in New York, I really suggest you go have a look. Um, I didn't manage to finish that. Yeah, lots of architecture. Yeah, this is more of a landscape. But again, I really enjoy the, 
you know, combination of man-made or human-made construction and then nature kind of overgrown over it, around it. I, I like that quite a lot. Another unfinished painting, a little, or a sketch of a little boat. Yeah, a lot of these are unfinished, but, and they probably won't get finished. This was yesterday, actually. So if you follow me on Instagram, which you should, um, this is, this. I just posted this, and it's a beautiful church in Malvern, New York. Like a Spanish colonial revival building. Um, um, Sahana asks if I take... So, you know, I think for some things... Well, drawing is important in general, but it's not... You know, I, I don't want to say it's not the most important, but... It depends on what you want to draw. You know, if you want to draw architecture, then, or you want to paint architecture, then then being able to draw is, is import, more important. But if you want to draw or if you want to paint, let's say, pure landscapes, meaning no buildings, just, you know, foliage and greenery and water, then it's not necessarily the absolute most important thing because hopefully you understood from the class that I'm thinking about shapes, right? And I'm thinking about, especially when we talk about foliage, it's not really necessarily all about intricacies, whereas in a building, you know, you have to think about um, how tall the building is, how wide the building is, and all these kind of different mathematical things. And if you don't want to sit there and be bogged down by that, which is understandable, then painting nature um, is probably the best way to go. And then you can concentrate on shapes and then think about shapes. Um, that's an excellent way to get started and then i think if you want to continue on working on drawing is, is is important and it shouldn't be something you know really difficult it should be something that you have a good time doing um you know there are plenty of exercises i'm sure you can find stuff on sketchy um for drawing i did a drawing tutorial for uh, portraits um, but maybe we'll do a drawing tutorial on architecture or something like that but thinking about shapes is important because ultimately everything is a shape, even if it's something incredibly convoluted. Um, you know, think about shapes and think about, you know, dark and light and what shape the light makes, what shape the dark bits make. So for example, if we look at this again, um, you know, if we turn this into a circle and then an, an oval and then another oval and then another oval, all you have to do after is just think about the negative and positive space, you know? And you don't have to be very good at drawing to just make some squiggly lines in this specific shape, you know? It's all really just shapes, and then you're kind of breaking it down into smaller and smaller and smaller shapes until you feel comfortable with what you're doing, ultimately, at the end. Uh, art by D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm... I'm right on the cusp of Queens and Long Island. So I paint out in Long Island quite a lot. I paint out in Queens and Brooklyn quite a lot also. Um, Manhattan sometimes. But Sahana, good, I'm glad. But, you know, I think don't be overwhelmed is probably the best advice I can give you. And then just take your time and get organized. Um, understanding how to attack a drawing is, is important. And once you kind of have, uh, like, the technique or at least... I guess the discipline to say, okay, large shapes, medium shapes, small shapes, and then you continue doing that every time you sit to draw or paint, um, you know, that discipline is important because as you continue, it'll just be, you know, second nature to do it that way. Oh, well, for example, if we look at this building, this is a, you know, basically just an enormous rectangle, right? It's a rectangle and then a rectangle going the opposite way. And then this is, if we look, I'm actually here, I'll draw it looking at the reference here. So it's basically a rectangle and then a second rectangle. And then you have these kind of wings that are connected.
and that, there you go. That's a building. I mean, but when you're when you're drawing architecture like that, you really also need to worry about perspective. And again, um, you know, this is something that you need to think about when you are painting architecture or painting, you know, something geometrical. That's that's kind of important. So, I mean, again, maybe eventually, you know, I'll do a class with Sketchy on, you know, drawing architecture or painting architecture. And actually, so when I do my tutorials, I'm doing two of them on landscape painting and watercolor. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I talk about some of this stuff if you'd like. Uh, I can talk about perspective and we'll talk about how to deal with that. Um, but don't forget to use my sketchy code. <laughs> oh, you're so welcome, Meg. I really, really um, appreciate that. And, and ultimately, that's the point. You know, I, I, I think um, when I was a younger artist and I'd meet artists that were, or friends that were really much more technically proficient at painting and drawing I'd always want to pick their brains and I also felt like you know most of the time these people weren't too terribly happy to share which I thought is silly um, because if you guys all become excellent artists that doesn't take away anything from me uh, that doesn't mean I'm not as good it means that we'll all just be better and that's important which is why I like to do um, you know, these tutorials and, and I like to, you know, teach because it's important. I want everyone to be as good as they can. And plus, ultimately, I think it'll be fulfilling. You know, once you realize you can manage to do this, you'll do it even more. And that's excellent. Okay, I really had such a good time um, doing this tutorial for you guys. Please, you know, check out my Instagram, and follow me and, you know, you can... Um, you know, take the sketchy course for landscapes. Please make sure you use my code. And thank you to Alexander and everyone at Sketchy. Thank you to you guys for all your messages. I try to, you know, explain and I try to read everyone's messages uh, as much as I could. Again, I'll finish the painting and I'll have, um, I'll have it posted on the Sketchy site for you guys. So you could see the finished product and what you know what I managed. So thank you so much, and um, hopefully I'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Peace and love. Oh, thank you guys. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Excellent. You're so welcome. <laughs>